Sali ako sa group coach, ha? Sure. Yes, yes, please. It's processing. In five seconds, we are live. Yes. Good to go, Jay. Walks. Yes, hold on. Okay. Yes. Are we live now? Yes, yes. Yeah. On Facebook page as well. So just we're just waiting for some technicalities here, arranging the technical technical is in using Zoom. Burns a record. Record mo. Ah, it's on the record already. Hello. Now recording. Okay, oh, now. Welcome everyone. Welcome Sir Charles from Kuwait. Thank you, thank you. Hello po from Thank uh, you. Hi Charles. <laughs> Sir Wax. Yes. Yes, yes hello. Nice to see you again. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Greetings from Qatar. Anyway, before we yes. officially start, are we good to go, coach? coach? Yes, yes, we're good to go. We're okay. live. We're live now. A pleasant good afternoon to everybody. Welcome to the FIT Qatar or Filipino International Thai Atlas Qatar Triathlon Talk Series, Episode 1. Actually, this is the first time that we will be doing it here. It's a podcast webinar. Okay. And once again, thank you for joining us. For all the triathlon fanatics, whether you are a biker, swimmers, athletes from all over the world. I want to welcome, welcome to or special mention to the Filipino, the FIT global chapters, like the FIT Kuwait, FIT Bahrain, FIT KSA, FIT UAE, FIT Dubai. And of course, I believe we also have some viewers and listeners from FIT Philippines. A pleasant good afternoon. So my name is Jay. They call me Coach Jay. I'll be the host or I'll be hosting this webinar series initiated by Fit Qatar Chapter. And I'm very, I will be, I'm very happy that one of my fellow triathletes, a good friend of mine, would be joining me as one of the hosts or commentator for this first ever triathlon or Fit with Qatar chapter Thai talk series. So I would like to introduce you to my partner. Um, he is Mr. Edward Sampelo, one of the Filipino pioneers of clients, triathlon sport in Qatar. Anything here since triathlon sport started way back in 2013, this, my partner of mine or this partner of mine is been very active. He also founded several sporting organizations in Qatar. He is the incumbent president of Filipino International Thai Athletes Qatar Chapter. He has been a member of the executive committee of FITQ since it was established in 2013. And I was, I was getting his qualification as, as a Thai athlete. I thought he got five, but I stand corrected. He is a six-time 70.3 finisher and multiple Ironman, uh, multiple Olympic distance. And during his first full Ironman, I was very happy and very honored to, to race with him when he did his first full Ironman distance in, in Roth or in Germany, in Challenge Roth. He's a multiple marathon distance finisher. He's a ultra marathoner. I'm sure you also heard him from the news. He's a mountaineer, and he, uh, most of all, he's an adventurer. Please, I would like to introduce to you my partner to discuss about Fit Club, Mr. Edward, aka Walk Sampelo. Partner? Hi, right, thank you. Thank you, Jay, Coach Jay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good day uh, for all the Fit. Uh, 
members and also our guests, uh, our participants. So I would just like to give a short uh, introduction of the FIT, uh, FIT club. So by the way, FIT is a Filipino International Triathletes Club. It's a, or referred as FIT club. It's an independent non-profit athletic organization. So it's a non-exclusive group. Although we there's a name of Filipino there, but we there's also other nationalities uh, uh, member of the club. So it start it's founded that uh, in March uh, 15, 2013. So right now we're already seven years. Uh, just recently we celebrated the seven years anniversary. So after 2014, uh, Pit Qatar was also established, and later on other branches of Pit. Global GCC and other parts of the world was founded also. So that's the brief uh, history of the Filipino International Triathlete. And I would like to introduce to you, by the way, our my co-host and uh, uh, coach Jainal. So he's a former president of Fit uh, Fit Q from 2017 and to 2019. He's also one of the coaches, fit Q tri, tri coaches, and a certified Ironman coach. He's also an, a certified educator and instructor for more than 15 years, uh, who advocate the teaching philosophy of see one, do one, teach one. Where he lived in this philosophy by being a triathlete himself before becoming a triathlon coach. So he's a poor Four times full Ironman finisher and a nine times 70.3 finisher, a third place podium finisher in 70.3 Dabao and first place podium finisher at 70.3 Subic. So he's also an uh, Ironman World Championship Kona qualifier and a finisher in 2018 and also a 70.3 World Championship uh, qualifier and finisher in Nice, France last 2019. So I'll give the mic now to Coach Jay. Well, thank you very much. That was a very, very uh, informative information or biography about me. Anyway, I don't want to take the floor right now because today, today's webinar or triathlon topic, it will not be all about me. We, will, we have two great triathlon instructors and, and coaches that they have they are willing or they have shared their time to us so i would like to take you in advance for these two coaches right and having mentioned this is the first series or the first episode of triathlon series or triathlon talk that we will be doing by a web a webinar or podcast and this is just the start uh, we're planning to do multiple multiple webinar on a weekly basis. And I'm hoping we can invite other coaches from other chapters or from other places. So if you're interested, if, you're, if you have a topic to share, if you have the same passion with us, I'm sure we are below, we have the same passion. We want to share our knowledge. So please approach us, me, uh, Press Walks, and Coach Bernard, please PM us so we can, we can schedule and uh, discuss with you how we're going to do the webinar. Okay, uh, going back uh, in this seminar, we call it the podcast or webinar. Actually, in the preparation of this, we were discussing about how to do or how to make the presentation. Finally, we decided, right, because I know in teaching or in triathlon training or races, we as coaches or we as tri uh, players or triathletes, we are using different parameters on how to measure our own intensity. So from fundamentals like RPE, then we will go to heart rate up to the advanced level of FTP that requires power meter and some crazy or gadgets. So we will plan for that one. So today, Having said, this is the first episode. The title of this podcast or webinar is How Fast or How Slow Can You Go? Right? So in this, you will identify, you will find out 
how fast can I go in a race or in a training? Or how slow can I go in a race or in a training as well? Or how slow, rather? So to start with, I would like to introduce our first speaker, right? Let me just you. So he is the first. Let me first introduce to you our first speaker. The first fit play athlete who finished an Ironman way back in 2015. He's a two-time Ironman finisher. He's a six-time Ironman 70.3 finisher. Former strength and conditioning coach of the Philippine team during his time at the Philippine Center for Sports Medicine way back in 2005 and 2007. Um, he has been a sports physiotherapist since then and currently the sports physiotherapist of the world renowned Aspire Academy. He is a USA triathlon coach. He's an ITU coach, Ironman certified coach. And from 2010 till now, he's paying it for making people realize how awesome triathlon is. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Coach Bernard Brian, Brian Pingol. Coach B, please take the floor. Thank you, Coach J. I actually felt uh, old on your, on your uh, introduction to me. <laughs> but anyhow... You deserve it, Coach B. You deserve it. <laughs> Let me fix my slides before uh, we start. I hope you guys see it properly already. So let's start. Again, uh, for everyone who is uh, tuning in from Dubai, Kuwait, Oman, Bahrain, Saudi, Manila, and we have somebody from uh, one of our friends from Tanzania right now. I pray that all of you and your uh, family are uh, well. And we are sending our regards from back here in Doha. So for today, I'm going to talk about rate of perceived exertion. Everybody can see my slides? Everything yes. is okay, huh? So RPE training is one of the most effective way of measuring an individual's effort. In a while, I'm going to remind you on how we can utilize the RPE method for our swim, bike, and run. Yes? Yeah. Uh, break, break, attention. Uh, please, please. I think it's okay, huh? Go ahead, coach. Okay, so like what I've said, uh, RPE is one of the most effective way of measuring an individual's effort. So this is actually the train-by-feel method or technique which has been synonymous among numbers of uh, professional, recreational, and uh, beginner triathletes. So if you heard that train-by-feel method, it's actually RPE. Now, before, uh, first off, I have nothing to disclose. Uh, our learning objectives is after this discussion, so you'll be able to know the essentials of training using RPE method. Second is for you to be able to use session RPE method effectively in your training with monitoring. So if you're a beginner who would like to learn how to properly use their efforts while on training, this is for you. This is also for the intermediate skilled individuals who would like to regulate efforts in training and use it for improvement. And this is also for all of those advanced level athletes who would like to have a variation on gathering training data. Take note of this sentences. Learn how to properly use your efforts, regulate your efforts, and variation on gathering training load information. So these three sentences that I mentioned also serve as the main benefit of knowing the RPE training method. So by definition, uh, rate of perceived exertion training is a type of training wherein you use your breathlessness and fatigue as a reference to measure your effort and exertion. 
the simplicity of its way of measurement makes RPE method effective. Because regardless of training level, even if you're a beginner, you're an advanced athlete, everyone more or less has the capacity of identifying on what we feel during training by means of how hard or how hard we are breathing. So I'll give you a bit of a background on how RPE training studies have evolved through the years. In 1982, uh, Gunnar Borg from Sweden formulated the Borg scale. So that Borg scale, I'm going to show it to you on the next slide. So the scale is basically a numerical representation of your efforts in training and work that you do. In 2001, it was a breakthrough year for RPE research when Foster and his group formulated modified RPE scale. And he introduced the session RPE method for the calculation of one session training load. 2004, session RPE method was used to measure training load among football players. So during this time, it was a very important uh, study because during that time internal training load has never been men, uh, measured on the elite football players especially the European so this uh, study by Impelizeri and uh, their group from Italia and uh, Australia actually proved that our session RPE method was a really good way to measure training load among football players 2011, uh, it was uh, recognized as a reliable method to measure training load in triathlon. And just recently, a group of sports scientists from here in Qatar, one of them is actually a colleague of mine in Aspitar and uh, Aspire Academy. His name is Karim Shamari. They reconfirmed the effectivity and reliability of session RPE training load monitoring. So there are loads of proven research published over the years uh, about RPE training from one sport to another, from diving, rugby, uh, even the miners, you know, the people who are working in minery, they have uh, RPE journals about them. Cycling, running, swimming, etc. Et so now this is the RPE scale. On the left is the original RPE Borg scale formulated by Borg during 1980. And on the right is the modified scale formulated by Foster. So the original Borg scale uh, starts from numbers of 6 to 20. So each number denotes an individual heart rate on each effort level multiplied by 10. So say for example in your training you identify that your certain training have an RPE level of 12. So in the uh, method of uh, Gunnar Borg, that is 12 multiple, multiplied by 10 it will be 100, it will be uh, reflective of 120 bits per minute on your effort. So if you notice the uh, reflection between RPE and heart rate has been present from uh, ever since uh, uh, of the studies of all of the sports scientists. They are interconnected from one another, RPE, HR, and uh, uh, the FTP that we will be dis discussing later on. Uh, with the modified one in the right, the modified board scheme, the numbers was changed and it, they uh, foster made it to zero to 10 scale plus the session art method computation that I'm going to discuss to you in a while. So both scales have the same training stress measuring factors, which is the way on how you breathe during exercise. So basically, if you can talk while you are exercising, you are at level nine at the original board scale, or that is level two at the modified scale, which is somewhat easy or in other description points, this is uh, the light level, they say. So nowadays the modified board scale is the one being used by different athletes, including us triathletes. 
uh, due to the session RPE method on this side. So from here on, I will be using the modified 0 to 10 RPE scale. So I hope you will not be uh, confused about it. So any questions so far? By the way, these are my two kids. Like you and me, they are triathletes. President Fox, so that ends, any questions so far? Yeah, that ends up. <laughs> well, that's... Thank you very much, Coach Bernard, for that short but very informative... Uh, regarding I, I will RPE. Still, I will still okay. have the application of RPE uh, in a while, Jay, yes. after the questions. Yes, yes. I have a few questions already got, got, uh, got it from some of our viewers and some of our colleagues. Even I myself, I just want to take this opportunity to ask a question to you or please uh, assist me in, in, in explaining to the coaches and especially to the athletes what the importance of controlling my efforts in place. To improve my to improve my my yeah, my skills, why do I need to uh, control my the effort or the intensity using the RP in correlation to the RPE topic that you just discussed? So by controlling your efforts, you'll be able to pace yourself well. If you pace yourself well, it will lead you to a better splits on your swim, bike, and run. However, you won't be able to master this technique of pacing during the race. You will have to do it multiple times during training, which is why it's very important for you to control your efforts during training so that when the race comes, you will be able to identify the pacing that you need to do in order for you to have good bike speed and swim slits and uh, run splits. I hope it answers that uh, question, Coach Jay. Yes, yes, yes. Because uh, please, please share me as well. Uh, especially when I am uh, applying this principle to my, when I'm coaching them. Because especially the beginners, right? They usually ask me, Coach, I'm very, I, I am, I'm ready already. Why is it you are controlling my, the intensity? Why is it? I cannot do a zone five. They're very eager to go to zone five or zone six or zone, if you're using the zone one to five, or why is it I'm not doing high intensity training? Well, in fact, I am ready already. What is the importance of this one, especially for the beginners? Uh, so the question for him is, when does he need to push, Jim? Yes. Uh -huh. So actually it depends on the level. Mm -hmm. More advanced athlete can push multiple days before getting fatigued. If, I'm, uh, if I may share my experience, I have an athlete that I was coaching. Uh, usually, he will do a push weeks for three weeks, four weeks. For, for a beginner, uh, a day or two of a push will be after that will be a recovery already. So... It all depends on the level of the athletes. More advanced athletes can push on multiple days before getting fatigued. Beginners need longer recovery, not just to recover, but to avoid getting through the sweat. Through familiarity on your RPE, time will come in your training that you can actually predict on when is the proper time for you to push or hold back. So this is the importance on uh, knowing uh, when to push and when to hold back in order for you to improve the fitness. I hope it, uh, it okay. answers the question, Coach Lee. Yes, thank you very much, Coach B. Well, I guess this question is coming from me. So I'll take this opportunity. Uh, as a coach, I do use a platform in monitoring the, the progress of my athletes. And me, I'm more on heart rate based effort or parameter, for heart rate based parameter is what I'm using more, my athletes. So usually I'm also using the training picks as a mm -hmm. mode 
of storing the. I'm sure you're also using training picks, right? Yes, yes, of course. So, as you can see in the training picks, if coach or coaches already identified the, the actual pace, the actual heart tones of the patient, of the patient, of the athlete, <laughs> what is the correlation of the heart rate? versus the RPE. Have you experienced in, in your athletes that somehow there is there are some discrepancy? Wherein, for example, uh, for me, I'll tell you, I have a heart, I have a, an athlete wherein if we play around in his zone four effort based on the tested, for example, we did a test on heart rate, threshold heart rate, for example. And based on threshold heart rate, is already reaching that specific threshold or specific heart rate range. But somehow along the line, it will vary. It will vary. For example, depends upon in which transition program that we are in right now. So do you also notice it to your athletes where in some of them by the numbers, like a heart rate range, is already on four, but when you ask the players, uh, the athletes, he will tell you, no coach, I'm not yet on my threshold heart rate phase. Well, I mean, oh, if I'm using an RPE from one to 10, it will be just around five or six. So have you encountered that, that difference between RPE and heart rate range? Coach B, thank you. We have a similar uh, uh, experience on it, uh, Coach Jainal. So like, like you, I always have that uh, comment from my athletes that, Coach, why am I already training hard, but my heart rate is actually not going up? So these are the comments that I usually I get from my intermediate to advanced athletes. Uh, usually when you get an improvement of fitness, the threshold for heart rate is actually going to get high as well. So you are pushing already, but the heart rate will not be as high as it can be due to the fact that you have already improved the fitness of your system, like the vascular system. In the beginners, uh, however, for the beginners, I always find that they have a good reflection of their RPE and heart rate. So that's why one of the things that I always... Uh, say to my athletes whenever they are beginners is that don't mind your RPE right now, uh, your heart rate right now. Why? Because I know that if they achieve a certain level of RPE that I am telling them, uh, most likely or uh, uh, just like uh, what uh, the research said, it is already reflective on their heart rate. So, I have uh, two different uh, experience on that. Usually beginners, they have almost the same RP and heart rate. They, the threshold for heart rate and RP of the beginners are the same. When they get tired, the heart rate shoot up, shoot up. But for the intermediate and elite uh, advanced level, sometimes they vary already, which is why uh, just relying on one measurement is not enough. You should have Variation, like if you are using RPE, you should use HR also and the power uh, measurement when you are already on the intermediate and advanced level. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I guess it, it was clear to some of the, uh, for most of the athletes who are re listening right now. So, Coach Jay, should I, should I move now to the application of the RPE? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. So, let me fix my slide. So right now, flowcharts are trending in the Philippines. So I look on my files to find one, and I put it on my presentation to stay on the trend. So this is my RPE flowchart. Uh, on the right side is the table of the modified uh, RPE 0 to 10 scale and its effort description. So 0 is rest, 1 is very, very easy, 
Two is easy or light. Three is moderate. Four is somewhat hard. Five is hard. Six is in between of five and seven, which is hard and very hard. Eight and nine are in between of very hard and level 10, which is the maximum uh, effort. So again, the easy level is defined as the level wherein you can breathe easy while you're doing your exercise. For me, when I have a beginner, I actually tell them that if you can sing while you are working out, when you are training, that is your easy level. So it is characterized as the level where you can talk like what I've said, effortless while you're doing training. So if you're starting to breathe hard, then your RPE will be between on this five to 10 range. This one on the pink until the, the red. So in training, regardless if you're doing swim, bike, or run, you should focus on mastering your RPE2, RPE3, RPE4, and RPE5. So these levels are where the magic of improvement comes, regardless if you are a beginner or a intermediate or an elite athlete. If you're doing RPE 0 to 1, this level is very easy. You're actually uh, not having a, uh, more benefit when you are doing this level. Why? Because during this time, you don't uh, have uh, your body exerting more effort so your heart rate is lesser uh, just to give you an example in order for you to if you have a goal of losing weight in order for you to burn fats you need to have 50 to 80 percent of your heart rate uh, percentage max so this will work on the rpe2 rpe5 rpe3 and rpe4 so now I'm going to explain to you further this flow chart. The most basic way on familiarizing yourself on your RPE is to master your RPE2, which is easy or light, and your RPE5, which is hard. So neglect the uh, levels of RPE on the sides that I'm, I'm uh, discussing right now. Just focus on this diamond shape RPE2 and RPE5. So if you have a beginner, if you're a beginner triathlete, if, you, if you're a coach and you're, you, you want your athlete to, uh, to get familiar with his, uh, with his or her RPE, tell him to train his RPE2 and RPE5 because these two are the most identifiable RPEs of a certain indi individual. Uh, if you're doing your training uh, if you can do the training, you can talk while training, that's easy. When the time comes that you will have a hard time in breathing, then automatically that's RPE5. So for a starter, try to incorporate short intervals interchanging your RPE2 and your RPE5. So over time, when you're familiar with your RPE2 and RPE5, you'll notice that identifying your RPE3 or moderate and the RPE4, somewhat hard, will be easier than expected. When you're efficient enough on your identification of your RPE2 and RPE5, you will be able to actually reflect all these training variables to a different uh, training variables like speed, pace, or heart rate. So again, Focus on mastering this green level RPE on this chart. Like any other training method, of course, uh, RPE training requires time. Uh, you need to be familiar with it. You need to do it repetitively. You won't be able to identify well your RPE in the first session. This is a reminder. There will be discrepancies, yes, but through consistency, your skill on identification of your RPE will be better and you'll be able to be efficient on doing it. So when you are good on identifying the two, three, four, five levels, this will be the time for you to risk a bit and explore trying to do the higher levels. So you might be asking what is the importance of increasing the level of your effort? I mean, 
Maybe you'll tell me, Bernard, I'm already uh, comfortable on my RPE4 and RPE5 and I'm, I'm improving. Well, to tell you something, your body is an excellent type of uh, sponge. It's efficiently absorbing training if you are training consistently. So if you want a continuous improvement, you must learn how to progress the load that you are doing. So my advice is stay using the six, seven, eight levels. This is the levels after the heart, so the very hard, and then in between it is the, um, uh, in between the maximal and the very hard level. Uh, do it twice, depending on your fitness level in a week. Uh, say for example, on your uh, single session per, per day workout, today you did a level RPE level seven. Tomorrow, on your bike, you will do level two or three, easy. The next day, you will do again another seven on the swim. So the key is awareness on what you are doing. If you know well your lower RPE levels, you will be able to incorporate the higher RPE levels in your system without any problem. Uh, what else did I forget? By the way, if ever you get lost or get confused in your RPE identification during trainings. This is re reflective to the question of Coach Jay earlier. So this happened among uh, intermediate and advanced athletes. Uh, for today, it can happen that your training is RPE 6. After a few days, you will notice that you've done the same volume, you've done the same speed, but your RPE for that training is only RPE4. This is because you already improved. So what will happen now if that, if, if that is the case for you? My advice is for you to go back again to RPE2. That's why these flowcharts have an arrow all the time coming back to RPE2. So the key for you, whenever you, you feel a, a, a readjustment is needed, you always go back to your RPE2 or light level. And then from there, you try to manage and uh, uh, estimate on what are the higher levels for you. It will be the same when you regress and or when you detrain. If you didn't train for a month, the usual RPE3 for you would be RPE7 or RPE8 when you go back to training. So by that time, you, you'll get confused. You will be surprised. How come before this is very easy for me and now it's very hard? So go back again to RPE2 and then from there you readjust. So I hope you guys, this, uh, I hope you guys will be able to uh, understand this flow chart. If you can uh, screenshot this, this would be very helpful for your training when you try to identify your RPE. So now, now that uh, you guys are familiar on how to choose the RPE levels that you need to have in training, I will be talking about now on how to measure it. So like I said, this is through the session RPE method. Session RPE met method has the simple computation of session duration times session RPE equals to session training load. So on the table on your right, you will see this athlete trained a bike session Sunday, 40 minutes. So that is, uh, he had the description of session RPE 7. So that is 40 times 7. That will equal to 280. So by identifying your session training load, you'll be able to identify also your weekly training load. So just like the same on uh, this athlete. So there's a computation already on the total daily training loads. And after that, there's also a computation for the weekly training load. And those numbers will be a perfect reference for you to anticipate when is the proper time for you to risk a little bit and push more, or this will tell you that you need to recover as well. So maybe you have another question. With numerous high-tech choices around us, giving us automatic training load numbers, as soon as we finish training, it's, it, we have loads of uh, watches that we are using in Garmin. As soon as you finish, it will identify when are you going to recover, yes? 
So does it necessary for you to get this RPE measurement? This is a bit uh, old school, but to tell you now, RPE method has its own unique effectiveness on training measurements. It's not perfect, of course, uh, but it's a good basic technique. If you're just starting and you don't want these numbers and it confuse you, it can be a good start for you. If you are a big uh, intermediate or an advanced athlete, this can be the variation that you need or you want for your training so that you'll be able to get that improvement that you want. So the guidelines in RPE, uh, all of these are research proven and self-explanatory actually. Having a good warm up will prepare your body on identifying your RPE while training, visualization. Uh, it's the current trend right now, the SWIFTS and all of those uh, online training platforms. It helps you mimic the real time training and races and will lead you to have an efficient RPE usage. Listen to your preferred music. Actually, this uh, uh, guideline, the music that uh, uh, a good music that you need to listen to when you're training. I found actually around five to seven papers uh, reputing this uh, this uh, the, uh, this uh, guideline. So it, it's really a proven fact and uh, at an effective way for you to have a good RPE training. Hydrate properly, vary your plan. Then the last one, rest then record it. So this is important. After your training, allow 10 to 15 minutes before recording it. The recommendation of researchers identify this as the most effective time frame for you to interpret your training efforts. Less than or more than this might give you some discrepancies. Some people, whenever we get tired of training, we want to, we don't want to do anything and we will sleep. And then after that, you will be forgetting the efforts that you uh, you use during that training. So record it 10 to 15 minutes after the training. And then after that, uh, according to research, you will have a valid and RPE training that is uh, have a good estimation on the training that you had. So I think that's it for me, Coach Jay. Well, thank you very much, Coach Bernard. It was a very informative presentation and topic. I'm sure there are so many questions in the mind of our listeners about RPE. Sabi nga nila, when we were discussing about our topics, it is correlated from one topic to another, like your RPE, the heart rate, and, and the FTP that our next speaker will be discussing. So do you have any questions? Let us give some time for, for few people if they have some questions. Otherwise, we can continue. Anyone from our listeners, can you please uh, message or type your message in the chat if you have any questions related to RPE or Coach Bernard? I'm counting seven seconds, five, four. Thank you very much, I guess. I already asked a few questions, Coach B, so I will not take more anything uh, any more of your time. Once again, thank you very much for that wonderful and very informative information about RPE. Looking forward to have a sequel regarding RPE. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, it, yes. It a plan. yes. Yes, as per plan, as per schedule. Okay. Thank you very much, Coach B. Once again, thank you very much. So I can... Okay, uh, let me just introduce to you our next coach that will be talking about FTP, okay? Our next speaker, or our next coach will be discussing about FTP. He earned his Masters of Sports and Master of Sports Science through the United States Sports Academy. He performed Mentorship in Exercise Physiology at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. He is a certified tactical strength and conditioning facilitator through the National Strength and Conditioning Association. He is a power certified by Training Picks, one of the founders of Endurance Lab Philippines. 
is a running performance coach. Up to date, one of his biggest achievements as a coach is we're in six, the members of the Philippine National Obstacle Course Racing won six out of six gold medal in the 2019 SEA Games. Ladies, gentlemen, please welcome Coach Saul Sibayan. Coach Saul, the floor is yours. Coach, just hold on. Hello. Hi, everyone. Sorry, my mic was on mute. <laughs> Apologize. Okay. Uh, thank you, Coach Zainal, for the introduction. Um, yes, uh, this is actually, I'll talk about power. This is actually a continuation of um, Coach Bernard's talk. And uh, everything is also related to, to what you feel. But the difference is we're measuring something which is your output, which is power. So without further ado, I'll now share my slides. Okay. Share screen. Okay. So I hope you can see my slides. Um, so of course, uh, just for my title slide. So it, everything I'll be talking about is of course revolving around functional threshold power or FTP. And for sure, some of you have been he hearing about this, um, especially if you're in Zwift or common folk actually ask about what's your FTP or um, divided by your weight. So what's your power to weight ratio? And this is a very good uh, metric to know because it tells you of your ability um, and what power output that you can maintain for a prolonged period of time. So first off is you wa we want to define what FTP is. So it is coined by, this is developed by Dr. Andrew Kogan, and FTP is the highest power output that you can maintain for a prolonged period of time before fatigue sets in, so before kamapagod. So it's very important to know this because um, anything, for example, you can maintain 200 watts for 30 minutes, okay? So if 200 watts is your FTP, anything above that, for example, 250 watts, then you cannot finish that 30-minute segment. Okay. But if, you, for example, you only push 150 watts, that's because it's below your FTP, which is 200 watts, then you can hold that for a prolonged period of time. So like, for example, maybe one hour or all the way to two hours. Of course, it depends on your ability to hold this power output. So FTP is the highest power output that you can maintain before you have any sign or symptoms of fatigue. Okay, so as an example, I pulled out a power file from one of my clients. And as you can see here, starting, this is a 40 kilometer time trial, which is done virtually on Zwift. And as you can see here, at the start of the file, all the way to the 37 minute mark, okay, he can maintain um, roughly what his FTP is at around 220 watts. But after the 37 minute mark, you can see that the power file is actually very, varies much. So he has to rest here, okay, has to rest here and on a numerous occasions. So it shows that he can only maintain his power output, his FTP rather, he can only maintain it for 37 minutes. And then every time he has to go to FTP, he has to rest for a bit. But when you look at the average power of this one, he has an average of 220 watts, okay? So, or 218 watts or two watts close to his FTP setting, okay? So it's not all about that your FTP is also your one hour power. It's not always the case, but definitely um, this is the power output that you can maintain before fatigue sets in, okay? So what are the tools to get FTP? If, of course, you need a power meter. Here is a power uh, pedal-based power meter okay, by Garmin, a head unit, and of course, a smart trainer like this direct ride. But if you have a power meter and combine it with a standard trainer, then you can always get power and you can do Zwift, for example. Okay, or you can connect your power meter to your laptop and so on. 
So it's not always, it's not, I, I won't say that a smart trainer is a must. Uh, for me, the practical way is to have a power meter because with a power meter, you can have power measurement, power measurement indoors and you have power measurement outdoors. So for example, if you're going to do a half Ironman or a full Ironman on the bike leg, you can measure power. So it's more practical and it's not as interactive as you want with, with Zwift. But definitely, you have the metrics to use for a, a prolonged period of time, both indoors and outdoors. Okay. So what are the tests to know your FTP? So for example, this is the 20-minute test by Dr. Andrew Kogan and Hunter Allen. And as you can see, that there's a warm-up period here with a couple of sprints just to activate your fast twitch muscle fibers. And then followed by a rest period and then a very important five-minute hard effort. Okay, the five-minute hard effort is important because it loads the body of, it's pre-fatiguing the body. Okay, so that five-minute effort is very important, and then you have um, close to ten to fifteen minutes rest. Okay, after that, of course, during the rest periods, you can hydrate, you can get off the bike and stretch, or go to the CR, for example, and take a leak, and then come back and start the 20 minute test. And when you, as you can see the power file of my client, um, he started off very, very clean. The power file is clean. And then all of a sudden it's very erratic and he was starting to push it up, okay? And when you look at this file compared to these other files, he nailed a new best 20 minute power. So it means that he has improved his FTP. So how? You measure the average power of the 20 minutes, or we call it 20 minute average, and then you multiply it by 0.95. Okay, why 0.95? You want to get 95% of the 20 minute power. Theoretically speaking, what your FTP is, you can hold it for close to 30 minutes to 45 minutes to even one hour. So that's why they say that 95% of your 20 minutes is close to your one hour power, okay? So there's another term, we call it time to exhaustion or TTE. And time to exhaustion is your ability to hold your FTP, okay? So going back, my client here has a time to exhaustion of only 37 minutes, okay? So it's not always the case of what, what your one hour power is, that is your FTP, but how long can you hold it that's the ability or what we call as time to exhaustion. Okay, so another style of um, FTP test is the RAP test. So as you can see here, it started off very low and each stage, it, it can be one minute per stage or two minutes per stage or three minutes, it depends on the protocol. Um, but on Zwift, it's a one minute per stage, a 20 to 25 watt ramp each stage. Okay. With Endurance Lab, we use a different protocol with a gas analyzer that we'll discuss later. So each stage here is uh, 20 watts increments until you say that no more. Okay, uh, I, I, can't, I can't increase the wattage anymore and that ends your test. Okay, or we call it volitional fatigue. Okay, or you just say, you just give up. Okay. If you don't give up, okay, the smart trainer will just continuously increase the resistance and um, and you just keep on continuing, okay? So with the test, like for example, Zwift, um, they get the best one minute power and they might and they multiply it by 0. 0.75 or they get 75% of your best one minute power. And that is roughly your FTP. The downsides of this test is it's not always as accurate as compared with the 20 minute test. I, I've seen it numerous times that this overestimates the, the FTP from the 20 minute power test, okay? But if you pair the ramp test now with the gas analyzer that we use, okay? Um, in any of the test, majority of the VO2 max tests that are done in laboratories and universities uh, around the globe is, is really a ramp test. And with the ramp test style and you, and you pair it with lactate or as with us a non-invasive way, which is getting ventilatory threshold with a gas analyzer. And you can now get what is your anaerobic threshold. So what your anaerobic threshold is, that is also your FTP. 
So it's very important for me, in my opinion, if you the style of with the ramp test is, of course, you don't pace it. There's no pacing involved as compared to the 20-minute test. It's very hard. The 20-minute test is hard because you have to pace it very well. If you pace it at the start and you hold it very high, it will be a negative split. So towards the end, you're dying. Okay? But if you have done it numerous times, the 20-minute test is a very good test because it's easy to do indoors and outdoors. Okay? You, know, you don't need a smart trainer on erg mode that will continuously increase the resistance with a 20-minute test. You can do it on a steady climb. Like, for example, me and my friends, we always go to Amadeo. That's our go-to place for a 20-minute test. There's less traffic. And there's um, one or two intersections. Um, there's less cars. So it's easy to re replicate this test. Okay. So questions, um, just let me know if you have any before I proceed to how you can apply the FTP test to your training and also with your racing. Coach, Coach Jay, you're, you're muted. Coach, so question. Are there any questions, guys? Yeah, yeah. I, I just asked some questions in between. Uh, between the 20-minute test and the ramp test, personally, uh, which do you think is the most accurate one? I know it will vary or depends upon the triathletes or the athletes, but because knowing the FTP is very important, right? And between these two, which one is the most accurate? Especially if you are incorporating or it incorporating it already on on race day, when we are as we coaches when we are preparing for uh, for me for for triathletes for triathletes in general, um, I like the twenty minute test because it it it, says, it it shows how well you can pace and the longer the the longer the Ironman, for say, for example, the longer the triathlon, the more it becomes a biker's race. That's for my, in my opinion. Okay, um, bike fitness becomes at high the the most important as compared to an Olympic distance, where I'd say thirty to thirty five percent or close to even for the three sports. But as you go towards Ironman, uh, the bike fitness because that's the highest in terms of time that you're gonna be outside doing that feat. So um, cycling, pacing your bike is very important because you don't want to crawl with your running on a full Ironman or a half Ironman. So yes. um, the 20-minute test tells you that you know how to pace. Very important. Not for, for triathletes um, in general. Because if on the 20-minute, of course, it's higher intensity, so it's going to hurt if you don't really train close to your threshold or slightly higher than your threshold. But um, for me, the 20-minute test is always a good test because it's easy to replicate um, with a standard trainer, a smart trainer, even outdoors. But of course, there are problems. Like for example, I've seen clients having a higher FTP when they ride outdoors, uh, when we do the test outdoors. And for example, if now we can't really ride in outdoors, so we do the test indoors, and they they give up, they give out a, a, a lower FTP, even though we have been training for so long. But um, regardless of that, um, it's easy to replicate as compared with the ramp test. You need a smart trainer, and of course, it's not everyone will have that opportunity or not will not won't have that uh, equipment at home. Okay, uh, before I will let you continue. And before going to jumping to the next topic, since we're talking about FTP test in particular, there's one question from from our audience, from Maastricht, I don't know. Uh, does, cadence, does cadence matter while doing the FTP test? Yes, very much important. Um, I'd say that you need to do the test um, on your self-selected cadence. So self-selected meaning... Uh, what you feel is comfortable for you, because what you, what the cadence that you're comfortable at is the most optical optimal. I'd say sorry, um, is the most optimal for your current fitness. 
Okay? So some, of course, you'll see like pure cyclists have a higher FTP or higher cadence. But when you compare during the Armstrong Ulrich era, when you look at Han Ulrich, he climbs with a lower with a mm. lower cadence. And when you look at Armstrong, even with his time trials, it's very high cadence. But I think you can apply that to long triathlon distances because our heart rate will go up and you won't be able to even run after. It's going to be harder, I'd say. So it again, it depends. There's no... Um, they say that for cyclists, it's at around 80 to 90 is the optimal range. Um, for I, I've seen it with my climbing as... Com- Transitioning from being a cyclist to tri- a triathlete, my cadence changed. It came, it became lower when I became a triathlete. So um, it, it's very important to know what's your cadence as well. I, I, I have a chart later that we can discuss more um, com- combining power and RP and heart rate in a way that you can, in a way, uh, interconnect the different metrics. Okay, actually, that was a question from Jonathan from Kuwait. Thank you very much. Okay, Coach, Coach Saul, you can continue. Go ahead. Okay. So I'll share my screen again. So to continue, why you want to know your FTP? Because with FTP, you can now establish your zones, okay, your training zones. Um, and as you can see here, it's color-coded, so it's easier to see. We always say that your threshold is the yellow zone. So it's not, it's like a stoplight. So you can push, okay, it's a warning that you can push it for a prolonged period of time or around um, 20 minutes to one hour. But as your power output goes up higher than your FTP, so your FTP is your 100%, okay, as you can see in, the, in this line, in this column, okay. So anything below that, so you can multiply, for example, um, my just for simplicity's sake, my FTP is 100. So if I want to, for example, um, pace a full Ironman bike leg, I've been telling my client to just look at your Garmin or any head unit that you use and just see their zone two. Okay? Because zone two is your endurance zone. You can push it for a prolonged period of time, okay, the level of fatigue will be low. And after that, you can still um, run after. Okay, so it's very important. Excuse me. Yeah. Okay. It's very important to know your zones on that level. For example, you're going to go with a tempo or it, um, you have a bit of endurance, but you're, it's below your your threshold. So we call it zone three or tempo. Okay. So this is the zone that you get. Um, we push this with our clients as their endurance zones. For example, they can train 10 hours or more per day. Then um, tempo becomes our zone two because it, it gives us the same adaptations as zone two for a shortened period of time. Okay? The downside of tempo, it's hard to do tempo on days, and then the other days, I would push them at zone 5. So it can be, it, can, it has its pitfalls, I'd say. So it's not always a good zone to train at. But if you are pressed for time and you want endurance, then it's going to be zone 3. Okay. Um, of course, if you want to improve your VO2 max, um, power at VO2 max, then of course, it's above your lactate threshold or it's above your FTP. So... Um, it's at around 120% of your of your VO2 of your FTP. Okay. And then of course, if you want to, if you're a sprinter, okay, or you're um, for example, a track cyclist that you are joining crits and bridging gaps, for example, you're um, an, an ITU triathlete and you want during the bike leg, there are sections, of course, it's a draft legal race, and you want to bridge gaps then definitely it's going to be either at around zone four or higher. Okay, So you also need to train those areas as well. So there, we call it the principle of specificity. If you want to improve something, you train at that intensity. Okay, And then, of course, as you can see here, what if you're not using um, 
power output, you can use heart rate as well. And with Coach Bernard, you can use RP. Okay, so this is just a guided um, way to train. So it's easier to be on the same page as a coach that when I tell my athlete that we're gonna do zone two today, so he knows what is zone two. Okay, um, another simpler way just connect power with RPE is this chart on the left. Um, the chart shows that, of course, if you're gonna go all out or 10 over 10, that is your zone seven or neuromuscular power. And then of course, all the way down, okay, is zone one or active recovery, okay? So um, zone one is active recovery. So you have to have an RPE if you go like easy spinning with your kids, for example, or wife. Um, then definitely uh, our friends, okay, Chica Pace, then that's going to be at around zones, uh, RPEs 1 to 3, okay? Um, based on our testing with VO2max um, before, RPE, why 7 is a very good tell, tell sign that 7 over 10 is your threshold, okay? We've seen a lot of clients having that RPE as their FPP. Okay. And uh, I just want to coin or quote uh, Master Coach Tim Cusick. Um, I highlighted this part slightly below. Okay. Part of the improvement uh, in peak power is mental. The ability to suffer is important. So you can really improve power if it's hard for you to hold it mentally. Okay. So even I've, I've seen clients training based on power and they tell me subjectively that it's hard, okay? So you're also training the mind with power as well. Okay, so of course that wraps up uh, what FTP is. And very important to know what FTP is because with training peaks, as we have discussed earlier, uh, we use also training peaks as our go-to platform for coaching. So all of our workouts are there. And we communicate, we monitor our clients if they are able to nail the certain power output um, based on F, on based on training peaks. Okay, because once you know your FTP, you can now establish your um, threshold power setting on training peaks, and that gives you um, a score. Okay, the score is training stress score, so it gives us a value of how heavy that workout is, okay? So just to add another metric, the other metric is intensity factor or IF, okay? Intensity factor is uh, giving us how intense the workout is, a, a numerical number based on your FTP also. So for example, um, you did a one-hour time trial. For example, that one-hour time trial is 40 kilometers time trial, a 40 kilometer time trial. So if you hold 40 kilometers, uh, 40 kilometers per hour, then you can finish that 40 kilometer time trial in one hour. Okay? And you were flat out all out all throughout the one hour. Okay? That will give an IF of 1.00 or 100% of your FTP. Okay? And because that is 1.00 in one hour, the highest TSS or training stress score is 100. Okay? Meaning you cannot get more than 100 training stress score in one hour. Okay? If you are, if you're, for example, or training peaks or you have a Garmin device or head unit and you have your FTP in place and after training for one hour, for example, you did the 40 kilometer time trial on Zwift or in any of the platforms out there and the TSS gave you, they the app gave you more than 100 TSS points in one hour, then definitely you need to adjust your FTP setting, okay? So as a rule of thumb for cycling, for cycling per se, you cannot um, get one, more than 100 TSS points in one hour, okay? So going back to the question um, about cadence, so as you can see here, if you test, then you get data, very important data. And that data, of course, anything you do, you always ask yourself, can I hold this for a prolonged period of time? Am I comfortable at this power output? That's your field, that's RPE. 
That's actually what Coach Bernard shared a while ago. Okay? And then from there, if you have power output, my, my second priority is always going to be power. Okay? So is that the load? That's the load. Okay. So if my power output and, three, and RPE are correct, they relate to each other, then how is my body responding to that? Okay, I can check heart rate. Some of my clients don't like wearing heart rate monitors because they can't breathe properly or they get irritated having like a brown uh, bra on. So they take it out. Okay, but, but if there's a case, then I can see that maybe temperature or um, your sleep last night is affecting your body. So there might be a drift in heart rate. Okay, so the other that you can optimize is of course cadence. As you, can, as you know that the higher the cadence from some people, the higher the heart rate, okay? But also in some people, the higher the cadence, the higher the perceived exertion or even a higher power output. So it's not always the case. Some people will have a lower cadence but a higher power output. That's what they're comfortable at, okay? Once they have a, a lower cadence, majority of people also have a lower heart rate. That's, that's sometimes a fact, okay? And of course, a lower perceived exertion. So it depends. So I know there's just so much things going on, but um, I have trained this way for numerous years. My, my Garmin screen is at around, I can see eight metrics all at the same time. I just focus on one and I can optimize my time trialing abilities, for example, a 70.3, okay? I know that my cadence should be at around 80 to 85, uh, my optimal is at around 83 um, because if I'm at that range on a flat section, then I'm on the right gear and I'm going to look at power. Is my power, my target power output, for example, a percentage of my FTP for example, maybe I'm targeting 75% um, of my FTP. So if my FTP is 100, I should be targeting 75 watts. It's okay? just for simplicity's sake. Okay? And of course, I'm going to ask, I'm only at the 40 kilometer mark of my 70.3 bike leg. I still have okay, um, 50 kilometers left that I need to go. Can I hold this power out? Okay, what, what are the sensations that I can feel? Is it hot? I can look at my heart rate. Is my heart rate high? Then definitely I need to hydrate or I might uh, get something. I could splash myself and cool down. Okay, so moving forward. Okay, we have discussed that already. Sorry, my... Hello? Coach Sol, your, your, your camera is off. Actually, naghang yung laptop ko. <laughs> uh, anyway, maybe while working on the technicalities. I'll, re I'll reconnect. I'll reconnect, Coach. Okay. We've got lots of uh, good questions coming from this. Yes, we already have some good questions here. So anyway, let me entertain one question while Coach, Coach Saul is working on it. Uh, Coach Press Walks? Yes. Are you yeah, yeah, yeah. We have one question from our uh, friend, uh, Michael. Uh, maybe you can answer this one. Coach, uh, how do we know if we recover after a long run that uh, we can prepare on the next training? Hey, Mike, can you know? Hey, Mike? Yes, that's Mike. Yeah. yeah, Mike. So for you to understand and know if you are fully recovered, you have to use some... Uh, combination parameters. You cannot just use a, a single parameter of heart rate or, heart rate or power meter, you know. So my advice, you try to reflect your RPE and your heart rate on that certain session. Say, for example, you use a level of RPE around 9 or, or 7 all throughout the two-hour ride because you were really racing each, uh, each other out. That heart rate that you will have on that one most likely will range around 
80 or probably 80 to 90 percent of your max heart rate. So the notion in uh, uh, Garmin Connect, all of those things, if you will take a look at it, they will give you a recovery of maybe more than 36, 36 hours. hours. <laughs> yes. yes. So uh, I don't want to comment about that because that's uh, Garmin Connect's technique or system. But for me, uh, on my experience on my athlete, if they are using 80 to 90% of their heart rate and then their RPE is around 8 already, a day off or two would be good for them before they can do a certain workout again with the same level. So I'm not saying that, okay, for today, uh, you did a very hard uh, long bike. So for tomorrow, uh, you cannot do training. You can still do training. But the recovery for that one would take you at least uh, minimum. I, uh, I can uh, uh, vouch for it. You need to have at least 24 to uh, 26 hours at least. And then after that, you might surprise yourself. You'll never know. Because like what I've said, your, your body is, is a unique... Uh, a sponge of absorb uh, absorption you know you can uh, have a certain level right now that after a week or two you are improving already so maybe a month or two before after a two hour all out ride you are dead for two days but time will come that after uh, uh, that that same effort you can do anything already after a day, you know. So yes. for me, yeah, yeah, Coach Jay. No, 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 go ahead, Coach B. Yeah, so I hope that answers your uh, question, Mike. So try to vary and try to use uh, yes the parameters that you need to. But basically, if you are already training well and if you are consistent with it, I think 24 hours, 32 hours of uh, recovery will be good enough in order for you to do a certain activity again with the same levels. Yes. In addition, uh, Coach B, I just want to add something also regarding the question of Mike. I know I understand we don't expect athletes to, especially those people who are using training to understand more about the TSS or what it all boils down to the structured training. As I've always said to athletes, you cannot perform threshold or heart rate on a daily basis. You cannot do zone four, zone five continuously for the next seven days. You may be, do, you may be able to do it for one, two, three days, but believe me, as just like what Coach Bernard said, it will affect the succeeding training program that you will have so as like what bernard coach bernard said you need to plan for it plan for it so yes, uh, plan certainly agree. yes yep. uh, i'm sorry i'm back okay. uh, so, uh, certainly okay. agree with, with coach reynald and coach bernard um so that's following the principle of hard and easy days if you're gonna go hard today definitely tomorrow it's a moderate or a light workout okay um, it, it, you can't push on a daily basis hard workouts or every day at FTP. So just to finish, I have like three more slides, including the closing slide. So uh, forgive me for having technical errors. My laptop hangs, so I have to restart it. So as you can see that um, of course, we know that your uh, a one hour all out um, yields a 1.00 IF and the 100 training stress score points for cycling. Okay, so just to share a couple of the workouts that we give our clients. So, of course, when you look at this one, our first one is a 20 minute um, tempo interval. So, it's zone three. So, it all of the workouts are close to one hour, as you can see, but each because each workout is at a lower or higher intensity than the other, it will yield a different training stress score point. Okay, so 
for example, if we do the 2 by 20 tempo or zone at zone 3 with a warm up okay, and rest intervals and a cool down at the end, the, that's one hour. The intensity factor is 0.8 or 80%. The overall um, normalized power is 80% of your FTP. The training stress score is 65. When you move now to um, threshold intervals, okay, the threshold interval is here is three sets at 10 minutes each, okay, and that and that duration is one hour also. But when you look at the intensity factor, it's 0.87. So it's a higher intensity than the first workout. And that yields a higher training stress score at 76. What if, for example, you want to hold, the, you want to train your ability to hold FTP for a prolonged period of time, then you can, of course, prolong the 3 by 10, maybe, of course, in the middle, it's going to be 3 by 15 or 3 by 18, whatever. And then eventually you can do two by 20, okay? A two by 20 for me is one of the hardest workouts that I give, okay? And it, it will give you also, a, it's a one hour, uh, one hour workout, but the intensity factor is 0.92, okay? And because that's a higher uh, intensity than the previous workouts that I shared, it gives us a training stress score of 85. Um, what if, for example, we push it at another notch, okay? but this time it's at a higher intensity, as you can see, it's 0.96, but it's less than one hour. Even the case of it's slightly lower time, but higher intensity, it gives us the same training stress score points. Okay, This is actually adapted from Hunter Allen. It's, um, it's actually a very hard workout, I'd say. I have given it to some of my triathletes as well. It pushes you to hold your FTP for 10 minutes and then each minute you increase it by 10 or 5% okay, until you crack. But here I'm just pushing it to five minutes. So it's a 15 minute work set. But after the 10 minute mark, you, can, you increase your FTP each time and that's until you say no more, like a ramp test. Okay, that forces your body to uh, hold it and then increase your FTP, okay? And that gives a higher uh, intensity factor, but again, for a short, slightly shorter period of time with the same training stress for points, okay? As Coach Janal said, it's the TSS or the style of coaching that we do with training uh, with Endurance Lab is actually uh, catered to a structured way of, of training. So to finish up, okay, do you have any more questions um, before I conclude? Actually, my last slide is hopefully everyone can follow us also. Um, uh, your support is very much welcome with Endurance Lab PH as well. But if there are any questions, we are also both on Facebook and Instagram. Yes, uh, <clears throat> Coach B, we have a few questions. Uh, Coach Saul, we have actually more questions here. Uh, yes, Coach. If I may read, if I'm training for FTP improvement, right? If I'm training for an FTP, FTP improvement, where is it? From the likes online application like Swift, usually on a day, each day, there is only one training plan. I was wondering, is it still beneficial if we, I can train after the said program, even though you only have one plan for the day? And I'm still not fatigued. Um, sorry, Coach. Naputol. Sapio. Naputol. She was saying here, actually, technically, she was saying here, she's using an online application like Swift right okay, now. Okay. And she is doing a one training per day. Okay. And like, as a half, somehow, she's asking in order to improve his, is his or her FTP, uh, do you recommend to go another training? another session on that same day because he, she, or he is not yet feeling fatigued. Okay, so you're saying like double days. We call it double days yes. wherein you have a workout in the morning, like typical triathletes will, will swim in the morning and then um, bike in the evening after work or run, right? Or vice versa, they're gonna bike first thing in the morning and then when they get home, 
It's either a swim or a run. So we call it double days. And yes. uh, it's important, especially for triathletes, because you want to balance the three sports. Um, it's hard to do, like, for example, you guys doing full Ironmans to just train one sport per day. Maybe for a beginner triathlete doing an Olympic distance, it, it can be done. But if, for example, going long distance wise, uh, double days is important. Yes, I would say I have clients doing that even on, cy- on the cycling side, like pure cyclists. Um, you can go like a high intensity in the morning and then slightly fatigued from work or some stuff that you need to do for family, of course. And then after that, maybe before hitting um, sleeping, you can do another lower intensity workout and that can increase endurance as well. Okay. The problem with double days is, of course, um, you're training your body to accommodate stress per day. Okay, I, I call it training stress per day, and then you have training stress per, per week, and then yes. you have training stress all the way per month. So that's how I really look, look at my, my clients' workouts. Um, because, for example, some clients can only train one hour in the morning and one hour in the evening. So I can't push them and I tell them that, no, you need to have this workout two hours straight. So I need to divide the workflow. So yes, it, it can be done. Um, I have seen clients improve endurance that way also. Um, and it helps mentally because some people can really train a one hour or more on, for example, a treadmill or stationary with the bike. So being st- stuck in one place as compared running outside or cycling outside, um, it's mentally refreshing being outdoors. So um, I'd say yes, it can help mentally, and you can do more work when you divide when you divide it. Okay, thank you. Can I add something about that? Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. About uh, the question of Bella, uh, seconding the opinion of uh, Coach Sol and Coach Jay. With with the uh, with triathletes like us, we are we are actually uh, unique among other athletes. You can actually train three sports in one day. That's that's mm-hmm. not a problem. But how are you going to manage it, and how are you going to divide the loads according to those training? Will be the one that will determine if you are going to be efficient on it. So yes. that's the uniqueness of our sports. That's the, uh, the beauty of triathlon. You train how many sports in a day, but how are you going to manage the load of it? That will answer the question if you are going to be prone or injury or if you are going mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. Yeah. So manage the load, one easy, and then the rest heavy, that will be fine. And then you have the RPE, you have the heart rate, you have the power monitoring, all of those things uh, you take into consideration, then I think you will improve. Uh, oh, sh- sharing as well, Coach B, uh, progressive overload. I'm sure everybody's familiar or some of you are familiar with the terminology progressive overload. It's like it's not training. Let me answer that question is, but, uh, in particular as well. Um, that we, we, we coaches, we structure the training session or training program that we're giving to our athletes. Depends upon the needs or depends upon the prepara- what in what phases of the training he or she is in right now, or what, what distance is he is preparing. So we, how many weeks training. So it's progressive overload to, provo- to, to avoid any injury. Yes, so, uh, certainly agree, coach. Um, like for example, of course, put into account that only all of those things as coaches we talk about uh, what's your current capabilities. Like for example, what's your current FTP? Um, how much stress you can accommodate is another question mark. Um, and how many weeks will I can I can load you? Depends on, for example, um, each one will have a different training schedule. Um, there are days that you'll be busy. So I cannot push you on those days because, for example, your your work for that day is demanding. So putting yes. those all into consideration before like using a training plan. Of course, a training plan is easy to get. You can get it online. 
can purchase it on Training Peaks and then load it. But we don't know if you can really, I'd say, I make training plans. But you, you can't really, I'd say, apply it full hand because that those lo the load may be too hard for you or, of course, can be too easy for you. Or there are days that you can't really push that. But, of course, working with you coaches and with other coaches, um, clients can now say that, Coach, I can I can every Wednesday I have a, an important meeting. I cannot miss this one. Um, that's my longest, for example, my shift at work today. So stuff like that. So, but yes, on the on the days that I have a client that can that, for example, typical for us, our weekends are the longest for the longest time that we can train. But for that particular client, his longest day should be Friday because that's his off day. So it depends. It depends on person to person. So it's very interesting to see um, how we cope with life and training. And of course, right now with, with this pandemic and how we can train efficiently without stressing the immune system as well. Well, I guess so, Coach, Coach Bernard, I'm sure you will agree with me. That's one of the differences between getting a program online versus getting a yeah. program after program from a coach. <laughs> because with no one uh, it cannot be monitored the the online program cannot be monitored so you need coaches anyway press walk Sol, yeah before we end your uh, your topic another question from dubai this is from coach alex martin so how open uh, you should have ftp test some said once a month or six every six weeks so, what is it? Um, I certainly agree at around four to six weeks all the way to four to eight weeks would be a good range. Mm -hmm. um, why? Because the body adapts um, as fast as three weeks. Okay, But maybe if you test four weeks after your first test, then, um, for example, this is your very first time to do the FTP test. Okay, And then, you maybe your pacing was off okay? and you stuck with that FTP setting for four weeks. And then on your, after four weeks, you test again. And you because you know the sensations based from RPE also, again, you know already how the suffering, you're expecting the suffering. So if I, I hold the suffering for this much, then I can finish the 20-minute test. Okay, Then definitely in four weeks, you'll have a higher FTP. Because you can you paste it better. Okay. That's the problem. I think that's the that's one of the pitfalls of the 20 minute test is because if it's your first time to do it, you don't know how to pace, it will give a low FTP setting. Or yes, okay. yes. But if you push and every time you retest, for example, the, the more often you do the test, the better you pace it, the better the result. So there are there are clients that, for example, I train after two months, so that's eight weeks. We test again. Sometimes their gains is only four percent, five percent. It's not as big as, for example, I've seen a client improving all the way to fourteen percent. Okay, so it depends person to person. There's no guarantee that if you train using, for example, the workouts that we give, it will give a higher FTP. Again, a, a lot of things to consider, recovery, how's your stress levels, um, your nutrition days before, okay? Um, because if you push yourself today, like Coach Bernard said, and you got injured, so a couple of days you're gonna rest. So those days, you'll, your fitness will also go down. So the rate of improvement will also diminish. So it's very important to stay healthy uh, every time you push hard today for example today's a hard workout to recover well so you don't get injured and definitely you'll see good improvements along the way so yes four to eight weeks is a good time period to test um, if you feel that four weeks is still not enough to see improvements then wait another month and train more yes can i add to that yeah go ahead coach burns yeah uh, totally agree with uh, what uh, Coach Sol is uh, telling us about the frequency of the FTP test. For me, to add to that, 
I always consider the periodization of an athlete. So, yes. Coach Alex, Coach Alex, let's say for example, you you have a an athlete uh, training for the Dubai seventy point three, which is around uh, January. So always remember that when you are testing, the result of that test, you will use it for you to have a good program of improvement on the next level. So try to yes. have that certain time that you will be able to incorporate the result of the test for the training. So in your case, if you, have, if you are training an athlete for the Dubai 70.3, January, if you will be training, if you will be testing, maybe you will do the testing around July. And then after that, the result of that, you will be using for your training. And then after the, the six to eight or eight to 10 weeks that Coach Sol was telling you, you retest again. So always have that uh, time frame into, uh, you'll, you'll consider that you will be able to use that result for you to progress on the level of the athlete that you uh, want to have. Consider the periodization all the time on the frequency of the test. I certainly agree with what with, with Coach Bernard shared. Um, the periodization is very important. And of course, knowing okay. when your next test or last test will be prior to your race so that you know what your zone to, for example, you're training for, you're preparing for a full Ironman, and what you know, you need to know what your zone to is. Then timing it a few months, like for example, even 21 days before you're full, and you do that test so that you can recalibrate because on 21 days, you won't be improving. Definitely, you'll be tapering, starting to taper, or you're just going to maintain speed, but less fatigue, definitely, on those days. So that's one of the best times to test prior to your race. And you know your zone too. And now you can pace the bike leg better. Okay. okay. So do we have any more first walks? I think, well, yeah, I think uh, that's a good... Uh, Answers from our coaches, so yeah, you can proceed, Coach Jay. No, actually, I hate to say, but well, I guess uh, that concludes our presentation for today, our discussion about RPE and FTP. Uh, I know there are so many questions still that some of our students would like to ask. And anything uh, before we conclude, any last message or information from our coaches. Coach B, let me start from you. Uh, I'd like to invite you guys for the TechOn webinar that will be coming soon for uh, our club. So the team right now that we are having is uh, still under uh, consideration. But rest assured that uh, we will be going to deliver again a nice uh, information web like this. Mm -hmm. Most likely, maybe after two weeks from now, yeah, coach? Yes, yes, yes. We'll do it after two weeks at least. Mm -hmm. Thank you for uh, attending. And uh, I think my, my uh, take home message for all of these things mm -hmm. uh, we are overloaded by information already RPE, mm -hmm. HR, FTP. We even have power uh, output on running right now that is uh, having an. Yes. having some uh, traction and gaining some uh, strength but uh, reliability is really good. So be wise on how are you going to use this information. And then from there, have some variations on your training. Uh, know when are you going to push and know when, when you are going to recover. I think the improvement will come soon enough if you yes. will uh, take into consideration all these things. Coach Saul, any last or take home message? Uh, take home, definitely, um, you cannot separate RPE with power. Although every time our workouts are power based, but I always ask some clients that, um, how do you feel with this effort? And there are days, like for example, uh, I know a friend who got tested with our VO2 max and was mm -hmm. eyeing to do the Ironman. Uh, bike leg on a power meter but on race day his power meter broke so he was <laughs> on field. so that happens so it's it very happened. important that 
you know that the sensations when you do their training with power okay because on race day anything can happen and that's her uh his a race for the year that's a full iron man so mm-hmm. all the while he was still training based on fear or, or racing based on fear so yes. even with all the uh, for, of course it's it sucks because for example sorry for the term but of course you want to review the file and you don't have the measurement out there but uh, you should be prepared for battle anything happens okay? uh, with power or without power with heart rate but always the mind is is very important that's my opinion. yes Thank you, coach. so same as well with me a take home message uh, we have different parameters on measure the intensity so well i guess uh, each and everyone should be familiar with all the, you cannot you cannot know or you will never know whether you are prepared for heart rate or rpe or ftp or power suddenly something went wrong on race day which is the worst part and it did happen to me in one of my races and i learned from there and lastly last take home message regarding the endurance and fitness level as i always said especially from a beginner jumping your endurance or fitness level from one to five is easy it's always easy if you have a structured training but jumping from five to six or to seven it will be challenging or difficult the main goal is to sustain the fitness level that what you are in right now don't be keen to jump into the next level because the deep, the challenging part is maintain that endurance or fitness level so anything else you want to say walks before well i guess that concludes our discussion or talk series for today so thank you thank you to everyone who attended this uh, episode one of our try talk so uh, just stay tuned for the next coming days or weeks we will send the event invites for our episode episode two so stay safe guys and all right god bless yeah god bless thank you coaches thank you guys thank you for thank you, thank thank you, you to all the listeners guys be safe coach soul okay. coach Bird, thank you very much see you Everybody's in. Just hold on. Partner, send mo sa akin yung ano mo. Ay, hindi. Send, ako, send ko sa'yo, partner. Coach Burns, okay. You can uh, exit now our... <laughs> Private group now. Hello, bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Until Thank next. You. Si Gas, oh. Gas, thank you. Thank you all. Guys, thank you guys. Hope to see you again next time. Coach B? Jay, dito pa ako. Yes, yes. Uh, let us just let everyone leave so we can... Tinanggal ko na yung recording. Yes. How many more online? Less than 10 na lang. Yes, yes. But it was a very good one. I didn't bother to call time, coaches. I know you were enjoying. <laughs> And then discussions natin, ha? Yes. Yeah, that's why even in our preparation, if, kasi if we will be waiting for, anyway, for those who are still with us, feel free. So we are just preparing for our next podcast and how to improve. That's why we're discussing right now. Hindi, gaya nga nung sabi ko, uh, yung questions may appear somewhere in the middle which is related to the specific topic so as per plan before the ba meron tayong discussion is either we throw the questions 
at the later stage or at the end, or we throw questions based 